when Shannon and I bought our first house, we had a home inspector come out and take a look at everything. And he didn't care at all about what color the walls were, about what type of flooring the house had throughout, about the color of the cabinets, nor what type of countertops were in there. My wife cared deeply about all of those things, but the home inspector didn't care about any of those things. The thing he cared the most about when he put on this jumpsuit was he crawled underneath the house in the crawl space, and what was he looking at? He was looking at the foundation, he was looking at the condition of the floor joists, he was looking for potential termite damage. He was more concerned with the thing that nobody typically looks at <clears throat> when you watch like an HGTV special and people are walking through and they're like, oh, I don't, and this one always, it just drives me crazy. I don't really like the paint color in here. I'm like, that's the, I, I'm not Mr. Tim Allen Handyman. Actually, I'm like Tim Allen because he always messes things up. Even I can change the paint color of a room. My goodness gracious, great balls of fire. But they don't care about the stuff you don't see. They only care about what's before them. The same is true with us in different areas of our lives. We care more about the highlight reel, about what, <coughs> excuse me, what, our, what our life does or doesn't look like on social media. We care about what people think about us. We don't care as much about the foundation of our lives, the thing that's really going to help us to last, we talk about marriage, for the long haul and forever. So as we launch our, our marriage series today, Till Death Do Us Part, we want to not focus as much on the glitter and the glamour and the countertops and the floors, we want to focus on the foundation. That's what we're going to launch into today is talking about what is your life built on and, by extension, what is your marriage built on? Because we get caught up in the things that don't matter as much. I'm not going to say they don't matter because they do. In fact, like when you look at <clears throat> what types of vacations have you taken in the past, will you take in the future? Important, not the most important thing. How often do you do date nights with your spouse? I think that's important. It's not the most important thing. <clears throat> what is your spouse's love language? How well are you doing at meeting their needs? I think it's important, and we're going to talk about all three of those things throughout this series. I don't think it's the most important thing. The most important thing is your relationship with Jesus. Everything else falls secondary to that. And what we have <clears throat> is two selfish sin-filled people becoming one, having their own expectations, having their own desires, having their own wishes, and then like a constant battle over, I'm not happy, I need you to do this, we keep score, we've got all these things. It's like, well, you said you were going to, and you never, and I always, and, and those fights happen because your relationship with God is off kilter. So I don't care what Oprah says, I don't care how much you watch Dr. Phil. I don't care what your buddies say when you guys hang out, and I don't care what their marriage advice is. It is all hogwash. The most important thing is for you to get right with God and to grow in that relationship first and foremost. <clears throat> then, once the foundation is good, we can talk about what color walls you're going to have, what type of countertops, flooring, etc. A big key for us is going to be Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Okay, <clears throat> Here Solomon says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. This is true in every area of our lives. This is true with life in general, and we want to apply it specifically to how we do marriage, how we do dating, how we do singleness. We need to trust in the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, with all of our hearts. This means that in every area of our lives, you believe that God is right and what he says is better than what anybody else in your life would say, including you. So when your wants, desires, wishes, preferences don't line up with what we read in God's word, you're going to choose to trust in God with all your heart and do your best to live in obedience to everything that we see here and lean not on your own understanding. Now, the idea of leaning is like you think of like crutches, you think of a cane. We are 
um, fallen human beings with all kinds of weaknesses, and it's like it pre- presents this picture. We're not strong enough to make it on our own. We got to have something kind of kind of help hold us up a little bit. And if you are leaning on the wrong thing, you're gonna fall. And I don't care how old and agile you are, or how young and agile you are. You fall on the ground too many times. It's gonna start causing you problems. Well, when you and I listen to these other voices in our lives. Even like, well, that makes sense to me. What ends up happening is you bring about death and destruction and hurt and heartache and just fill in the blank. So we want to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and in all of our ways submit to him. This is going to be a difficult thing because you're going to want to, in some area, you could be good in like 98%, but there's 2% where you're like, I don't know about this. This is really hard to like give over to God. But in all your ways, submit to him. He will make your paths straight, which is to say he will give you level footing to be able to walk on. Because once again, we have to lean on something, crutches, cane, whatever, and he will make our paths straight and even so that we can move throughout life with little disruption and issue that are tied into self-inflicted wounds. May I give you an example of this? Thank you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3. Let's say you're dating. And, and today we're going to talk about how do we do singleness, how do we do dating, how do we do marriage with, with this idea present. Here's what Hebrews uh, chapter 13 verses 4 and, um, or just 4 says. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually and all the sexually immoral. Conventional wisdom would say, hey, before you get married, it's good to try things out before you officially say I do, before you get the ring, before you stand for a judge, before you sign papers. And so it's like you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, would you? Why would you get married without a test drive? So maybe you live together for a little extended period of time and just make sure that you're compatible, make sure things good. And like that's what conventional wisdom would say. And all your friends would say that. And they would say, you're going to listen to dating advice from a book that was written like 2,000 years ago? They didn't even have iPhones back then. What did they possibly know about dating and relationships? Like the 90s are wrong about dating and relationships. Surely what was written in the Greco-Roman Empire, I mean, I don't even know what that means. So you're going to listen to what the Bible says? It only makes sense to live together before you're married. Now you go to any college campus and you have that conversation, they would look at me like I had 17 heads. Some people say like two heads. They would look at me like I had 17 heads, like no, I, yeah, I, I try my best to follow all of this. But statistically, and this is the most interesting thing with it, statistically couples that move in and live together before they're married are exponentially more likely to see that relationship end in divorce it's counterintuitive you're like well it only makes sense it goes against principles that we see in God's word and if you want to do something that God has given humanity as a gift which is marriage You should probably do it the way he says to do it. You remember the 1960s, right? I don't, but some of you do. The 1960s was the sexual revolution. That's when no-fault divorce came in. And it was make love, not war. And it was like this liberating time. I think if if you look at our country, you start from there and just move forward. Everything has gotten worse, including our marriages, relationships, our kids, everything has gotten worse. Because it's like, that was like one moment where we drew a line in the sand. We turned our back on God's word and said, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't murder. That stuff we can get behind, but don't tell us how we're going to do relationships. And everything has gotten worse since then. So you can buy into conventional wisdom all you want. It is a detour off of God's plan, and it ends with your marriage going off a cliff. So I I am old-fashioned in a lot of ways. I have an old-school mentality 
in, in so many areas of my life. And you know what? I'd rather look like Andy Griffith than whoever, I don't, even, I don't watch TV today, but whoever the leading star is on today's TV, I'd rather be like Andy Griffith than that guy. And you've got to decide for yourself. Am I going to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding, or am I going to buy into the conventional wisdom of the day? Now, when we think about single, dating, married, let's first talk about singles. Because in our church, we're going to have all three present. I, I want to talk to somebody other than just married people for a four-week marriage series because you may not be married. Now, they're single and they, you're young and you're ready to mingle and you're looking to get married someday. There's single because of being widowed or divorced and you don't know if you're going to be looking to get married. Everything in between. The advice is still the same. God has to be the most important person to you in your life. You pursue him at the expense of everything else. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. So that is your priority number one. Whether you're looking to eventually date and get married, or you're like, I'm good where I'm at, I don't, that's not a desire for me anymore, you seek Jesus above everything else. That's also if you're dating, that's also if you're married. But the one thing that I've noticed, I think it's harder to be single now, and it's harder to date now, and it's harder to be married now than any time in American history. Whenever we think about being single, depending on your age, you don't have to get very old before you start to feel a clock ticking down and you feel pressure. Like, I need, I, man, I need to find somebody, I need to get married, I need to start having kids, and it's an internal clock that isn't, <coughs> excuse me, isn't necessarily grounded in like reality, it's like I feel like I, this needs to be happening faster than what it's happening for me. And, and people get really freaked out and they worry about how they're going to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. And it's like, well, where are they at? Are there dating websites that I can go to? Like, how do I find them? And I'm not opposed to dating websites or whatever. But what I do want to encourage people with is instead of how you're going to find this person, I'm more concerned with what type of person you are becoming. And your goal, if you're single and thinking about dating eventually and thinking about marriage eventually, you should be focused on becoming the person that your Mr. or Mrs. Wright is attracted to, that they're looking for. If all your time and energy is spent on finding them, and not about growing in Christ, and not about becoming who Christ wants you to be, then when you find that person, and they're here, and you're here, you're not the person they're looking for. If you're focused on growing in Christ, and you move up, and you continue to become the person God wants you to be, then you will attract that person to you. More than how do I find that person, it's like who are you Becoming. That is a much more important and deeper question. And in every area of our lives, you need to remember Ephesians 5. But among you, there must not be a hint, even a hint of sexual morality. Try to live that out in today's world. My goodness gracious. Not even a hint. You see those cooking shows and they just like pinch of salt? Just bloop, bloop, throw it in there. I don't know why that is the posture. I thought it was a joke until I saw an actual guy do it. I'm like, oh, that's what they do. I've never done that in my life, except for a sermon illustration. Won't ever add salt that way. So you're like, just a pinch of rosemary, just a little bit of thyme. You know a little bit of thyme in something? When I eat it, I'm like, ooh, I can tell it's got thyme in it. Doesn't take much. It's an overpowering thing. I don't like it. Cilantro, on the other hand, I go to Qdoba, I'm like, can you add extra cilantro and jalapenos to that? I love cilantro. My wife can't stand it. Sometimes I get hers to add a little bit. That way it's like, oh, you, don't, you don't like that? I'll finish it. It's okay, honey. I'm, I'm here for you. But like whenever you think about just a little bit of something like that in a dish, you're like, it just goes a long way. So Paul's like, not even a hint of sexual morality. Whew. Whether you're single dating, or married, 
This is one of the areas the enemy tries to get you tripped up. And it's like, well, this is natural. This is how you're wired. And this is okay. It's like you're just looking or you're just thinking and you're not touching. It's not that big a deal. I was in FCA a few weeks ago. And, you know, the kids, they go and they grab lunch. And and I was just walking by and I saw a book on the table turned upside down. Which is interesting to me because I didn't think kids read anymore. And as I walked by, I just glanced at the back of the book. And I thought, oh gosh. Like they're just words that jump out at you. And you're like, these aren't words that I want a young lady in high school. I don't want this, like this isn't good. And I thought, I wouldn't let my wife read this book. Let alone some 16 year old girl. And I just thought, it just... It just weaves its way in, and there's more than a hint of sexual immorality there, because it gets, it gets people thinking and fantasizing and yearning for and wanting. It's like, you're bringing this in, and you, you can't just kick it out easily. There are things you can't unsee, that you can't unexperience, and so now it's here. So now any relationship that you have, this is the metric that you're using to grade who people are and how they are. It's like, you, you, like the best way to keep yourself from that is you don't even put it in there in the first place. I'm more worried about our young men. So the books that, I mean, this, the, the stuff that the that girls read, it's not good. But you start talking about the access to these inappropriate websites, it is limitless, the amount of depravity that is available, both to men and women, but like young men, like they're having their brains rewired as to what intimacy is supposed to look like. And you could just get on, and there's so much that you can see, and it's like, this is not good. There's nothing wholesome about this. And when you say not even a hint of sexual morality, that's all it is. And whenever that comes into their brains, now this is what intimacy is. It's, it's what they've seen. And it's like it starts in one way, and then it gets into all of this completely and totally unnatural aspects of sexuality. But it's just like a drug addiction. And it is an addiction, by the way. It's just like a drug addiction. You have to take more and more and more to get to the same high as when you first experienced it. So now, when you're single, you are being fed all of this. And you have access to all of this. And the enemy's deepest desire is to ruin your marriage before it even begins. So, like I've got um, an almost, almost 14 years old and a 10-year-old, and I've got all kinds of guardrails for them. I want to make it as hard as possible for them to stumble into things that they shouldn't be seeing. Now, are they completely 100% protected? No, because they go to, like, my junior higher hangs out with his knuckle-headed friends, and they talk about things, and they probably, you know, but I try to set up a, a situation. It's like, if you ever see anything, you come talk to me. You're not going to be in trouble. I'm going to get that kid. But like someone shows you something, you know, you're not going to be, but you need, I, you come talk to me. That's okay. And then I pray, 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 pray. Oh, I pray for their souls, their minds, their hearts, that they're guarded by the grace of God. Because you and I, we have no idea the damage that our kids today can face just so naturally. So that, I mean, if you're single, Focus more on Christ and who you want to be in Christ. And then the, the, the dating stuff, the marriage stuff, takes care of itself. Now, when we talk about dating, I personally, in my understanding of God's Word, I am against, like, casual dating. Now, you could be friends with somebody of the opposite sex. You can hang out in a big group. I'm all for that. But casual dating is like, hey, you know, we're dating. It's like a friends with benefits type of thing. There are no benefits until you get married. There's a song about that. It's an oldie but a goodie. But when you think about like 
dating in today's world, oh, never date someone that you're not willing to marry. And whenever you start dating, it's so hard because you don't date people you're not attracted to typically. And it's not like when you get married, okay, now God's going to plant the desire in your heart. The desire is always there. You hit puberty and you're like, I'm desired up. Let me find this. Let me find this woman. Not even a hint of sexual morality. Oh, that's a pretty doggone high standard. That's, that's why I was the kid in youth group saying, okay, so I know, I know like the full-on intimacy is wrong, but like where's the line? So what can I do with my girlfriend? Because I'm walking right to that line. I'm putting both feet on it, okay? I want to know what we're allowed to do. And there's no good answer there. Because, that, and that's legalism, by the way. It's to get as close to the line as possible. <clears throat> we should say, how can I honor God and stay as far from the line as possible? Okay? But when, <laughs> when you're 17, 18, like, I married my high school sweetheart. And there were so many times I'm like, babe, hands off, okay? Not even a hint of sexual immorality, all right? My eyes are up here, sweetie, okay? <laughs> and I will say this, that by the world's standard, we didn't do anything. By God's standard, there was a hint of sexual morality. I didn't have any good locker room stories to tell. But when I think about it, it's like, there was a little too much passion, and because she wasn't my wife yet, there was lust present in our relationship. But you do your best to honor God, and it's better for you once you say, I do. I promise you that. But then when, you're, when you think about dating, you got to put up guardrails. And you got to say, if, if purity is important to us, if we don't even want to live with a hint of sexual morality, you're going to date differently than every single person you interact with in the world. Jesus' standards are really daggum high. But they're high because he loves you more than you could ever imagine and doesn't want to see your relationship head towards that cliff. I, think, I probably used this illustration before, but it, it's apt, Okay. Because God has given us that as a gift to enjoy. In fact, marriage was given to humanity before the fall of mankind. That's Genesis 1 and 2 he gave us marriage. And I do think he gave it like, to us so that we can be com like, complete. Because men and women are different. They're wired differently. They're given different gifts. That's a real controversial statement in today's world. But we complement each other. So that when, is it Jerry Maguire? When he says, you complete me. Isn't that the movie? I think I fell asleep during that one. You complete me. He's not all wrong. Like men and women come together, become one, and we're complete. But God did not give you marriage in any way to punish you or in any way to be miserable because it was given to us before sin entered the world. It was God's design right out of the gate. And so then it's like, okay, if we're going to, live this way and have this wonderful gift it's got to be within its parameters so you got a fireplace you don't light a fire anywhere other than the fireplace if you're in the kitchen and you're like boy it'd be nice to have a fire in here you're going to get our guys to go to your house after you burn it down because like, you, like the fire is in the fireplace. If you light a fire anywhere else in your house, it does not end well. But I like fire. That's great. Put it in the fireplace. So you start talking about intimacy. But I like it. You should. God gave it to you as a gift. But only in the fireplace. Only in the context of marriage. Anywhere else, it's going to burn down the house. Now, we don't believe that really. We don't believe that because when you look at, when I say we, I mean just culture in general. Because <clears throat> when you look at all the statistics and the way that, <clears throat> that people that are dating now do things, it's like, I mean, it's everywhere. And it's just a matter of time before that thing goes up in flames. So honor God, whether you're single, whether you're dating, whether you are married. Now here's the thing with marriage, is that 
when we think about putting God first in every area, it is unnatural for us to do so, but your life only gets better when you do so. And you can talk about date nights, and you can talk about love languages, and I think those are incredibly important. I never start there when I do marital counseling, though. I don't say, so do you guys know your love languages? I do that in premarital counseling to set them off in the right direction. But we do marriage counseling, it's like, okay, we're, we're fighting, there are issues, what's going on? And it's like, well, he never picks up his laundry. I don't know if you've met a man before, but like, if it, is it close to the basket? Like, we, he gets points just for being close. But like, you know, it's like all these things, I'm like, this is like such a nitpicky, of course, all marriage fights, by the way, are that way, aren't they? If you came up here and I gave you a microphone and you and your spouse recounted your last fight, you're like, yeah, that's pretty stupid. I, sound, I feel really stupid saying that we fought about this out loud. That's 90% of marriage fights. 10% the cops are called. But most of the time, it is just silly stuff. And it's because, and like I think about like any fights that I have with my wife. It's like, yeah, I'm a selfish person. That's why we're fighting right now. And my, the way I fight is like, well, you, you always, you never, and I have to. But no, the reality is I'm selfish. Why am I selfish? Because I'm either not as close to Jesus as I should be, or I'm drifting away from Jesus, as opposed to growing closer. So you want to you have a strong marriage? You get up tomorrow morning, and you read your Bible, and you pray. Well, what about date night? We'll get to date night. But you're a sinful, selfish person. So all you're going to do is take a sinful, selfish person, put them with another sinful, selfish person. They're going to be together for date night, and that'll go well at some point for a, a short stint. But at, you know, at a certain point, it's like we've got to work on the sin nature that's in here. You read your Bible and you pray. You want to get really crazy? Pray with your spouse. Like, what if you made it a goal? We're going to say a 30-second prayer together before we do our day. You were talking about an intimate moment, really. And some people are like, I can't do that. That's, that's too much. Okay. I'll keep office hours so that you can come for your marriage counseling later. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you now. I'm already giving you the answers to the test. Like, hold hands, or you can hug. It's easy for my wife and I, because she's like a foot shorter, so you just, she puts her head right there. We can pray. And you pray over your spouse, you pray with your spouse, you pray for your spouse. And here's the thing, is that the most attractive thing, you're not going to read any of this in those magazines that are by the checkout at Kroger, Okay? The most attractive thing you can do is become more of a selfless servant for your spouse. That's the thing that makes you more attractive. I'm all for getting in shape. I'm all for exercise. I'm all for all that stuff. My wife does not care how many push-ups I can do. You could ask her. She may be like, I don't know, seven? I have no idea. I don't care how many push-ups he can do. She cares about emptying the dishwasher. I could do push-ups all day long, but I empty the dishwasher? I've done something that she's like, you're going to have to stop. The kids are here. We can't, I can't look at this. This is too much. Okay? And if I wipe off, clean up after dinner, wax on, wax off. You better watch out, man. And if I, if I read my Bible and it helps me to love my wife and kids sacrificially because I, I can be more drill sergeant-y in my approach to problems and situations and it's like, this is the solution. No, nope, we don't need to talk about it. We need to go do it. And if I become more like Christ and I'm more tender and I'm, and I'm a little softer, I and it's not, it's not who I am naturally, but it's who I can become if God helps me. That's the kind of stuff I need to be focused on. So in your marriage, 
You may have visions of grandeur, and you may say, well, this is, this is what I need to do. And you could be single, you could be dating, you could be married. This is what I need to focus on, Jesus. That's what you need to focus on. And if you put Christ first in your life, and you put, both of you put Christ first in your marriage, not only will your marriage survive till death do us part, it will thrive throughout the entire process. Prioritize Christ over everything else then see the blessings that come to your life as a result of it.